Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning for those on the West Coast. Uh, thank you for joining us today at our Cybersecurity Collaborative uh, virtual briefing entitled uh, A CISO's Guide to Developing an Effective Application Security Program. Um, I'm Tom Skura. Uh, I'm moderating uh, this session. Uh, I'm the VP of Contents and Programs for the Collaborative. It is my privilege to have here our executive sponsor, uh, Andre Sandro, uh, who's the CISO of 2U. Uh, 2U is in the business of software development, so very uh, appropriate to have uh, Andres here today. Uh, they provide uh, high quality digital uh, you know, information, organizational information to many nonprofit colleges and universities. Uh, as he mentioned, he has a lot of uh, students uh, they have to protect the data on and, and provide great services to do as they do. Um, I'm also pleased to have here uh, Chris Fouts from Humana. Uh, uh, Chris is, uh, Humana is the third largest uh, health insurance uh, company uh, and, uh, you know, 41 out of the Fortune 500. Everyone uh, knows them. We've seen many commercials. They do wonderful things in this area. Um, so we're glad to have Chris who's in, and who has shared a lot of his application security knowledge and perspectives in developing uh, many of the things that you'll see today. And we're hoping to have a John uh, a Creekmore from Pacific Western Bank join. He's been tied up. Uh, he may join uh, sometime during the course of this. Just a couple of administrative items. Um, there is a Q&A box for those on the call that wish to uh, uh, post their questions. Uh, we, you know, please do that. We'll get to them toward the end of the session. Uh, there'll be a poll at the end. We encourage you to uh, answer the questions in the poll. I remind everyone uh, for those who have certifications that this will count as one full CPE. And if you'd like uh, as evidence, but also for informational purposes to have a copy of the presentation, uh, you can request that at, at the end of the uh, session here, there's a, a page to do that. And uh, members, it will be available to members uh, through a weekly member update uh, with access to the member portal. Um, also, when we get to the end, uh, there's a great blog on, on application security that Andres has put together. I'm going to give you the URL for that, and I encourage all people to uh, access that for some really great perspectives and insight on security from a person who's been here uh, doing this for over 20 years. So um, let me just start off by talking about the Cybersecurity Collaborative for members who are new. Uh, new members, obviously, will know this, but uh, those who are considering joining us, we are a collaborative organization. We're been vendor neutral. We are not sponsored by any vendors. Um, naturally, on our uh, team calls, we do talk about uh, tools that are used and discuss you know, which ones are working for us and which ones are not and how to integrate them. Uh, but we, we aren't paid to do this. The members who join here uh, pay. And uh, with the object of collaborating uh, on solving different problems in this expanding space of cybersecurity. Um, the collaboration, it works that some organizations have solved these problems and have uh, good ideas while others are, are learning to solve them and they share. And, uh, you know, collectively, we all kind of improve our security postures over time. Um, for those out there that are new to the hearing about the collaborative, this is, um, an organization for both the CISOs and the staffs of the CISOs. For the CISO, we offer many uh, services. Um, one is the daily morning security report that you get at 6.30 a.m. Eastern time on all the major security events. So you can do a quick read before you go into the office and then hear from your boss about, well, what's happened here and how are we responding to it or get your teams to use it. And that we're finding out that members are using that report in their security awareness programs and doing analysis on it. It's, it's, it's a, a, a great uh, a read and update on major security events. CISOs also collaborate with other CISOs through boardrooms and uh, task force working groups. Uh, and also there is a ask the expert rapid response. Uh, CISO can uh, you know, pose a question and that goes out to all members of the collaborative 
and uh, there are answers uh, provided to help the CISO solve his or her problem. Uh, for staff, um, we have uh, a library, we're continuing to add that, of CISO developed tools. Um, it's very searchable. Uh, we provide uh, not only guidance documents, but templates and tools to help frame problems uh, and solve things. And, uh, and also for staff, uh, there are called task forces that we have. This is one of them on application security, where we get together, we have a, a set uh, number of topics we talk about uh, over eight weeks. And out of that, we share our experiences, um, help solve our questions and problems. And out of that, you know, provide our best practices and some tools that we offer to other members in, in the collaborative. And of course, um, you know, those task forces provide a way to gain educational CPE credits as well. Uh, so you can consider uh, joining here also to meet some of the training needs of your staff. So I just want to remind everyone, it is a collaborative independent organization. Today, um, talk a little bit about the task force. Um, the discussion scope on this topic, which is very huge, uh, some of the deliverables we're finishing up. Um, application security, uh, what we know about it, a lot of threats and also a very, very uh, expanding complex environment. That's one thing that's come out of our task force. Um, what we decided is to appro approach this rather than, you know, it's such a broad topic. If you're a CISO new in an organization or a new CISO in an organization, um, or you want to just kind of get a, a, a sort of a grasp on, you know, how well the, the organization, application development organization is doing from a security perspective and how to improve it. We've come up with six uh, broad questions that the CISO should ask and answer and some uh, tools and uh, contextual representations to help you provide the answers that lead to uh, prioritized strategies and tactics. So that's what we're gonna go through here today. I mean, certainly we could we could delve into containers and dev dev ox and so forth, and we we've done that in previous teams, but that's our our scope here today. We'll provide a um, a recap, talk to you a little bit about the task force uh, deliverables at, at the end of this, and and obviously have time for a, a Q and A. Um, so let me just talk about this, the application security task force. Um, as I mentioned, we have weekly meetings consisting of collaboration and team member contributions. Um, Chris is an example of uh, you know, Humana coming through and, sh and sharing uh, their perspectives on security and where we do testing and that kind of thing. And, and uh, he, among others, was a very valuable member of our team and a contributor. Um, members share um, successes, false starts, and challenges. Uh, we're all under NDA, Chatham House rules. Um, every one of us here has, uh, and myself included, have made false starts and you know, wrong ways of doing things and, and representations that um, you know, we all know that. The thing is to you know, obviously pick up and, and improve and learn from that. And to learn from others. Um, learning from others is a, is a great way to kind of move forward in addition to our own mistakes. So we share our successes, false starts, and challenges. Um, I'd like to say also collaboration during these teams. We have members get to know other members and they collaborate offline and they help each other, not just on the teams, but that's part of it as members of the organization. So maybe a member is bringing in a new tool a new scanning tool, or maybe a new code review tool. Uh, they talk about it and this worked for me, this didn't, this was hard to integrate. That's the kind of information you, you, you get by being a part of this group and collaborating. Um, I don't know, Andres and, and Chris, I'll just ask a little bit about your thoughts on, on the collaboration that we have and the value to your organizations. And if you, you want to share a couple of things that would be helpful. I'd love to. Um... One of, one of the things that, this is, I think, my fourth task force here. One, one of the things that always comes across as adding great value is taking all of these varied perspectives from all the different groups and all the different individuals that come together and then having all of that collated into one 
consistent message that we provide, you know, by way of these documents uh, that we share with the community. I think that's invaluable. Uh, I've gotten personally, I've gotten great value out of that. And ha having been in this industry 30 years now, I can only think back to what used to be the think tanks of the old days. And this is really a modern day equivalent of those think tanks that were much larger, much slower, much more expensive. And I just, I think there's tremendous value in all of us just coming together and really sharing our, our challenges, you know, where we fail fast, where we didn't fail fast, and all those wonderful war stories that we share. Um, Andres, you bring up a good point I forgot to mention too, um, as, in, as a CISO um, in, in a very prominent organization. Uh, on the ex executive committee, uh, it is the desire of the CISOs and the executive committee to wanna to reach out to small and medium-sized businesses who struggle with this and don't have the resources as much. I mean, we have that desire in this team to bring on uh, those areas to, to provide them with some of the tools to help them deal with the complexity of this. I mean, uh, we're, we're fortunate being large organizations um, and well, fortunate also having great responsibilities for the information that we have, but we, you know, we have investments in these things that other organizations may not. So thank you for sharing your perspectives. And Chris, I know that on the team, you certainly, um, uh, gave so much value to other team members, but perhaps heard some other things from other members that were might have been interesting <laughs> and useful. Yeah, I think that's the value is you have people coming from different areas, some from large organizations, others from small organizations, from different verticals, and to bring all those uh, all those backgrounds together in, in different approaches that uh, that can all be successful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you. Um, so let me move on to the to the discussion scope. I think um, this is focused on organizations that do their own development, uh, more so than taking a lot of third party code and just adding a, additional value to it, or working with in the SharePoint and in, in, in doing, for example, some some minor tweaks to it. Um, it's primarily benefits the CISO is trying to improve the security of develop applications in a, a very changing environment. It may be often at first to security pressures. We'll we'll talk about that. You know, everything, you know, as we know in our lives, we could possibly do everything we could do it well. We're not for the fact that there are too many things to do and we and, and, we're, and all those things are competing for our time. That's really the human dilemma. Enough on the philosophy, but I think it's true. And I think um, what we're trying to do here is to provide some way where the CISO can uh, you know, uh, formulate some strategies in a priority or order uh, to work through some of these things. And this is not to say, and I think Chris will, will certainly share that there are, are great um, external organizations like BSIM and SAM that really provide very in-depth services. Um, you know, again, as a, as a collaborative, we don't specifically endorse them, we don't have a relationship with them, but when, when members endorse them and, and say, yes, I've used them, they've done well, then we want other members to know that. So there are other things you can, can look at in this area, but it's our perspective from the CISA who's coming in to, to take a look at. So keep that in mind today. And the discussion of security controls focuses on those directly relating to applications. It is important that the infrastructure controls all be in place as well, uh, as we know in defense in depth to make all of this work like patching OS systems and so forth. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of, wrapping that aside, uh, but it is important to do in our discussion today. The, the deliverables we're finishing up, um, you know, taking us a while to kind of put together these concepts, but the concepts are pretty solid. Is we'll be taking this information and we are putting it into a, a quick guide. And some of the uh, concepts you'll see here, we're embodying in, in a, a questionnaire kind of tool that will help um, provide outputs, um, that, you know, to, to, for the CISO to help make those priority decisions. And that's in a, a security workbook that will be coming out in a, in a little while. Let me just, first of all, um, everyone's going to go, I'm just going to put these quick points up. Uh, when we started to talk about all these things, it became very, very uh, obvious that this is a very complex organization. Um, complexity and also the targeting aspect of this 
are the greatest challenge, challenges we all have. Um, you're hard pressed to find one common definition of DevSecOps. I, I think uh, John's not here, but I think this is coming up with something finally. And, uh, but every organization banters that around differently. Um, and, you know, there's, there's all kind, kinds of security, not just general controls, but when you get into APIs and so forth, uh, it becomes more complex. There are different development methodologies. Those are only a few we put on here. And they're different architectures. You know, are you software defined architecture? Are you looking at microservices and containers and that sort of thing? So, um, so it's hard to kind of solve every problem in all these areas, but the complexity has to be looked at from a CISO to be able to kind of manage those things. And uh, uh, it certainly is a challenge. Third party code is another thing. Um, and really what, what we have here, the obvious thing is you've got a development team taking third party code in some cases and, and uh, producing uh, production applications could be in the cloud on prem to external and internal customers. And then you have a hacker trying to uh, break into third party code and also production applications in, the, in your organization, the security. Uh, you're sitting there trying to pump in requirements to these teams and also do the testing or be the gatekeeper in all of this. Uh, while it, you know it, it's not just complex in terms of development methodologies and coding practices and security, it's also because of all the interfaces we have here. Um, so uh, the other thing too is um, application security is a key target. Um, web applications hacking, if you uh, look at the Verizon uh, data breach investigations report of 2022, is up there uh, around 60% as a top vector. Um, so web applications are still being uh, uh, hacked, if even looking at uh, other things, it's, it, it's at the top of the list. Um, the other things, and I presented this before, we know that third party um, systems and code is also something that uh, provides uh, uh, vulnerabilities to us. Solar Winds attack uh, was, you know, why Cozy Bear and all the other customers that were affected by a modified plugin that was attacked. Uh, uh, and we actually put out a little uh, brief on this in the uh, collaborative for those that um, wanted to know more about it. And CISOs, um, again, this was a, you know, a trusted uh, source of information that, that was attacked by uh, hacking our Russians for an intelligence service um, as a way of, uh, a great way of compromising, not great for us, but a great way of, uh, I guess, for the hacker of getting into multiple environments relatively quickly. Uh, Log4j vulnerability, again, uh, the same thing. Um, it was uh, allowed performing remote code execution. We needed to send a simple malicious request and, and that was picked up by the Log4j library. And again, it was in libraries, embedded code and cloud apps and uh, with software providers. Uh, again, we, uh, when these things come out, we typically put a team together with the CISOs and issue advisories. One of the benefits is we collaborate on how best to do this. And I remember on that team, uh, uh, members were saying, well, avoid doing this, wait until this comes out because we had a bad experience with them. But um, that's kind of a, an aside. The key is that application security is clearly continuing to be a target not just our web applications, but the third party uh, source code and applications that's provided to us. Um, so with the complexity and with the fact that this is something the CISO needs to worry about, um, we've, we've had discussions of this and uh, there are six questions the CISO should ask and answer. Um, and uh, the first is the criticality of uh, applications security to the business itself. How important is the development of applications to the enterprise? And we're gonna go into the ways to answer these questions, but if it's what you do, uh, like Andres does, or it's very important, uh, again, in terms of Chris's uh, business, then um, obviously, the ability to continue doing that is important. Security also is important as well. 
The second thing is uh, it's critical, but what are, what are my risks? Uh, what are the privacy, security, and regulatory risks to the enterprise? Um, again, if you're dealing with uh, protected health information, you know, there's a lot of regulatory risks or privacy information. Uh, there's privacy risks uh, in, in all the states that you deal with, et cetera. Um, but there could be also risks, uh, you know, to, to the availability of the application, which, which you need to have up as well. So you need to understand how, how important is, is this organization to what we do as an enterprise, and then how much risk is it also um, introducing into the enterprise. Um, the third thing is the environment that you're, you're working in. You need to understand what the current plan applications development environment is. So um, in many organizations that say, we're gonna move from waterfall to agile. No, we're gonna move from development to DevSecOps. Um, we're moving from an SD um, system defined architecture to microservices uh, thing. Those movements are not trivial and the desire may be in the best intent of the organization, but they do interject potentially a series of risks, particularly when you're talking about how to address uh, security uh, uh, controls and so forth. So you really understand, we build on that, how important is it to business? What are the privacy security risks? What is our development environment like and planning to be, okay, as a CISO? The other thing you wanna do is, okay, so we understand how this, how we perform it. What kind of, you know, what, how's the development organization performed relative to reducing application security risks? So are, they, are, they, are there defects going in the environment? Have we been hacked? Um, uh, you, you know, again, that kind of is a, you know, just because we haven't been hacked, but reducing a lot of high and critical vulnerabilities may, may still be a problem and part of the performance. So um, how well we're doing also may help the CISO decide to emphasize the importance of security and put in some uh, other things. Then in the context of this, um, what privacy and security controls are and need to be in place. Um, and lastly, as far as the support goes, and this is important, and I turn it around to war roadblocks, but in terms of measuring it, it's, it's how much support are we getting in terms of improving, um, implementing, improving private security controls. Is, is security seen as a roadblock? Are we not willing to invest in tools? Do we have poor policies and practices? So these are all questions and answers that the CISO really should figure out to be able to develop a strategy to improve the security of, uh, of, of, uh, within the applications development environment. I'll just open this up to, to Andre and, and, uh, and Chris. I don't know if you have anything to comment on this, if you care to, otherwise we can move on. I just want to let you know I made it time. I was one minute behind. Hey, you told me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Dr. John Creekmore is here as well from Backwest. Thanks, Sorry. No, don't worry about it. Thank you. Glad you're here. I, I knew you, you would come. I knew you were busy. Um, any, any thoughts on, on, on this? I don't know from your experience and... Not we can we can move on. I'll, I'll delve into it. Um, so let's let's talk about criticality and why this question is important. Um, the importance is obviously to determine investment levels, delivery timeframe, pressures on the development organization. If this is key to the organization, the organization will want to get this code out and, and get money for it and management's willingness to protect the security of developed applications as well. So um, in, a, in a situation where the development market is not seeing really critical to business kind of supporting, but you have the privacy security risk, you still have concerns, but management might be more willing to deal with those knowing that their whole business depends on it. Um, and the other is to evaluate how important um, the applications development, you, know, right, you need to consider the business value and speed to market. And two ways to look at this is on a continuum, a high, medium, low uh, case. Here's some, some examples. At the highest level, our business is, is developing commercial applications. And at the lowest level, uh, it's 
developing applications tangentially supports business processes. I've seen organizations that use really uh, SaaS applications. They don't do a lot of development. They might do stuff in share file. They might be on the low end on that. Doesn't mean that, you know, so the criticality is less, uh, but when you're actually developing these commercial applications and that's what your business is, that's important. The other thing is speed to market because, uh, uh, you know, maybe everyone wants all production deadlines to be met, but in some cases there's, there's more of a need. You've got to make this deadline and uh, you know, I, I, I don't want it missed. And that really can pose a challenge to security, uh, you know, especially if, you're, if security is a gatekeeper to, to meeting those production deadlines. So, uh, so those are the things that you need to consider to answer the question about how important development of applications is to the enterprises. The second piece is uh, risks. Let me go through this as well. Um, you need to understand the privacy, security, and regulatory risks. And risks need to be determined in terms of uh, in, in confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the information, but also the application itself and the regulatory and contractual risks. Um, a business impact analysis is a, is a good way uh, to identify this. Chris pointed that out uh, to us. Um, and so again, uh, in terms of the questionnaires that would come out, how important uh, or high is the confidential integrity risk to the, to the information? Um, our develop app applications channel sensitive personal data or intellectual property, for example, at the upper end, at the lower end, it's public information. We all know that. Available Availability risks. Um, if you're providing a commercial application, and it's a SaaS application, uh, your customers may have contracts with their customers to have your application available. It, it, it often moves down the line. I've seen that happen. So, so what are the risks to the availability of that application? And then um, I know in terms of what Jonathan's organization and Chris's organizations, uh, surely there are significant uh, at regulatory uh, concerns, the banking business, the healthcare business. So those things need to be obviously factored in uh, to um, you know, assessing uh, the importance of, of these risks to the organization. I'm sure you'll agree with me, uh, Chris and John, right? <laughs> Without question. All right. Um, Let's, let's continue on. The, the third question is um, the environment. Uh, understanding the current and planned applications development environment will help determine how to implement and operate security controls most effectively. Um, to do that, you gotta look at the applications architecture, the SDLC methodology, the organizational model, and the sourcing model. So um, you can look at uh, different things. Some of these are, does SOA, we talked about this, John, SOA versus microservices and how security, the approach to either architecture is very different um, as is the SDLC that you're using um, uh, and, and, and as, as is the organizational model that you're adopting and whether or not you're internally doing everything or externally sourcing things. Um, Don, your comments, I mean, I, I, you know, on moving from SOA to microservices and the challenges involved with that, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think you just got to understand, like, you know, security within the pipeline, right? The life cycle of the supply chain of the development of the product or service and understanding that environmental context and relation around it better. Um, you know, that's kind of the challenge with the, you know, organizations, you know, security risk posture and profile is changing, right? Environmentally, uh, right. outside of the application, you know, you keep that in mind when you're approaching, uh, you know, doing a self-assessment questionnaire, right? Asking yourself, are we ready for, um, you know, a dev or integrated DevSecOps or security, you know, function built within the development or, you know, outside of it. And then also, you know, you mentioned that management strategy. Are we gonna self-manage it fully? co-manage it partially outsourced or fully manage it outsourced as a, a strategy, right? And then at what point in time do we look at transitioning that? Yeah, and I think that the, the transition, you know, can involve different security models. And, and as we've talked about shifting to the left and different 
uh, models where you're asking the developers to be more in charge of the security controls. This doesn't mean that the security department, we can talk about roles, doesn't um, give up, relinquish its requirements, uh, uh, roles and responsibilities, or, or maybe a, being a, a final uh, a, a checker, a tester. But some of the actual checks, uh, security checks are done in the tools and, and brought in the development organization, uh, given a move to microservices or, or possibly even going from waterfall to agile, where you know, things are uh, done at a quicker pace in a different way. So I, I think the bottom line is you, you, you really have to look at um, the model that you're now using and whether or not you're planning to go somewhere else because the degree that you're planning to go somewhere else changes the way you're doing things. If things are static, obviously you can statically look at the controls and find out where you need to improve them and, and, and make some probably immediate changes. But when things are dynamic, becomes a little more challenging. Another thing I'd like to add to is as, as you move to micro, I mean, one of the perfect example here is as you move to microservices, there's some trade-offs there. When you do your scanning, you have your number of application assets is just gonna skyrocket. So the number of assets that you have to manage is, is going to go up and, and that increases the level of effort. But at the same time, you know, from an agility perspective, your scan times are gonna go uh, are going to become much quicker, uh, which allows you to scan more often, uh, and you don't have that overhead of a, of a two-day scan uh, to do those. So there are trade-offs as you start switching uh, your application architecture that you have to be aware of. Oh, that's that's brilliant. That's great, Chris. Exactly. There you go. So um, so more, but shorter, and maybe you catch them sooner as well. That, that's mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. Is it? Not really different things. So these are some things strategically that we we need to consider. Thank you for that. Um, the other thing is to measure performance. Um, and you know, one way to look at that is to see whether or not we are introducing critical and high vulnerabilities into the production environment. You don't want to wait to find that out. We all know that. You know, it's it's like the whole quality paradigm, you know, of, you know, do it right the first time and early on in the processes. And I think that model applies here, albeit it may, it may be difficult to do, but you do want to look and see whether or not these things are in there before, before you, you know, obviously you look at incidents, but um, hopefully you're not having as many. Um, and also another way to look at it is uh, through penetration tests, which will do a little bit a broader look beyond the critical and high vulnerabilities. They'll kind of look at the environment that you're developing in and whether you know your passwords are are proper and access methods, et cetera. So, uh, but these are ways that are uh, important uh, to do it. One way might be to track uh, defects per release. We just have a security metrics team. We were talking about this and the challenges of de defining that and how you do it and getting the information from the scanners or tools that you're using is always a challenge. But, uh, uh, and, but again, if, if the company itself is not seeing this as a problem, but you're showing it is in terms of the defects and you can show what an exploit might be in a critical vulnerability or show another company that has, hopefully you're not engaging in those discussions. But if you need to, showing uh, some metrics is a very valuable way to kind of make your point uh, across. Um, then there's the evaluation of privacy and security controls, which is really what we're all about. Um, so there are a number of ways to do this. And one is what we've done is we, we've taken uh, NIST and others and kind of put them in uh, these broad categories of controls like training, vulnerability management, testing, asset inventory, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, one is to use this control effectiveness and coverage maintenance. The, the coverage is, are you, you know, is the, is the control covering every, everything? So developer security training, are all developers being trained? You may have one developer trained out of 50, uh, you know, and train them very well, but your, your coverage is low. Um, and the effectiveness is, you know, is it, is it really making a difference in terms of reducing defects and so forth? So this is a very simple model 
that we have here at the, at the CSC. I want to talk about a couple others. Um, and, and looking at this, you know, these are things we're doing well, these are the things we're doing poorly. Here's where we need to increase coverage, and here's where we need to improve effectiveness. The other things I wanted to talk about, and again, Chris, you brought this out, and I know Andres, you've mentioned it too, I think you brought on your blog. BSIM and SAM are very robust measures. Again, I'm not endorsing them from the coalition standpoint, but for members using it, might be something for others to consider. And Chris, you talked about that and brought that up and, and, and shared that with us. Maybe you want to comment on, on BSIM and its value. Yeah, so so BSIM is is produced uh, commercially. SAM is is uh, produced by OWASP, which is an open source consortium on on application security guidance. So these are very robust, uh, but also involved tools to use to assess your application security program. Not necessarily to compete with uh, some of the stuff that we produce. Uh, some of the stuff that we produced are are really quick hits that that you can use to quickly assess. But if you want to do a little more in-depth assessment, uh, you can delve into these and, and commit some more resources uh, from that standpoint. That, thanks. I, I thought it was a very, very robust methodology. Um, again, uh, you may want to consider bringing in a, a, a consultant that specializes in this to help your organization. Um, it, it gives credibility to it or just just simply to administer the actual processes and SAM being another one. Um, so, so if you're, you know, again, if in doing this high level analysis that we're providing, you're finding we really need to delve in this a little bit more, they may be good options for you. And you can actually use some of the results from our assessment here to encourage, you know, the more in-depth analysis. Um, all right, let me move on because uh, I also wanted to show, here's a member contributed S SDLC framework. Um, more in a way without, I'm not gonna go into the, the details on it, but here's a good way to kind of look at where all the security codes fit into this SDLC. Number number one, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, great in terms of that perspective to help members adjust or develop their own. The other thing is, it's the type of thing that members do share and contribute here. Not all of this is developed out of the team, but members do provide uh, the direct contributions. So uh, the other thing I wanna talk about um, is, is in terms of uh, third party code, we have talked about this in uh, our other uh, task forces. What you need to do is make sure you have a good third party risk management program that basically um, requires them to have a, a, an information security program, good application security practices, vulnerability management practices, and the participation in your incident management processes, and that they're, you define these contractually. Again, we have uh, guidance on these for those. Uh, and vulnerability management too, that there's the identification of vulnerabilities in both and scans, and this remediation and, and a software build of materials uh, so that when vulnerabilities happen, you know where they are. Um, again, this is a separate topic that we've covered before. Um, the last question I want to talk about is support. The sixth question, um, understanding support levels and roadblocks will overcome the challenges with successfully implementing and operating security controls. Um, so you've defined that we need to do other things, but what are the road, roadblocks that you're facing? As a CISO, you need to know these. Speed over market over security controls. Um, and that goes along with a view that security is a roadblock. If culturally that's happening, um, then you're going to have to deal with uh, improving security while not holding up the production works. Um, and that produces more challenges, but you need to know that that's what you need to do. Uh, again, the security organization's role with the development organization, um, visibility, participation, authority, has that been defined? Um, lack of tools and processes, you know, maybe you don't have tools that, you know, in the development organization, or maybe you don't have uh, good security policies. So one way to look at it is in the four areas, speed over security, security is a role block, the role lacks of tool, tools and processes, you can just map uh, where you are in, in, with regard to these things. And 
that gives you an idea of how difficult it is going to be to implement these things and what you need to consider as you're, you're doing it. Um, just talking about the security role, uh, some way to look at it, uh, it's going to vary depending upon the methodology you're using and the architecture you're following. Um, and this some way to look at it here, um, you will probably always be a rule maker to maintain and create policies and standards. You'll never let the development organization just um, go off and say, well, this isn't important. This isn't from a security standpoint. You have the expertise. There will be trade-offs that you'll have to discuss in, in, you know, with them on certain things, of course, uh, but it isn't, you're not gonna let them make the rules nor will you um, not be, in, to some degree, a checker or enforcer or, or, or tester, you know, beyond the development side into production. But what you might be different, have different roles is whether or not you're advisor or a gatekeeper. Um, you may be more an advisor in an agile microservices environment, what, what, what have you, in terms of you know, the tools and consulting and, and stuff that the, the developers are going to do from a security standpoint, because they're going to they're going to adopt more of those functions. Uh, and you may be more of a gatekeeper in a waterfall environment where you're not going to let something go without it, the scanning done and I sign off on it. And even in an agile environment, you can do that. But in an agile environment, you might even have a security person on staff that's kind of ushering that along. So um, so it, it's important for the CISO to think about the role of his or her organization relative to the environment that the, uh, you're, you're developing in. Um, so I'm going to move along here so we can get time to Q&A. And uh, as I said, this presentation will be available to all participants and the members of the collaborative. The way you look at this um, is, is kind of, uh, it, as I said, if you map the answers to those six questions in some type of high, medium, low scale, you can kind of group and see how important and how risky the development environment is relative to how well you're doing from a security standpoint in terms of control performance and support. This shows a huge difference and a big challenge for a CISO. The only saving grace is that they're not deciding to move necessarily to another environment and there may be some stability to help you put in some improvements. But by doing that, um, it will help determine the priorities and tactics. And we look at sort of five key strategies. Um, closing the control gaps is always a key one, but formalizing roles and responsibilities in the environment is also important. Which, which is the responsibility of developers with security organization? The refresh of security requirements is, is making sure that as we're, you know, we're now moving into containers, we're doing some other things that the requirements for security are known to the developers and they're within the tools and updated in the tools that they're using as well. So obviously they, they've got to be current. Leveraging technology is important too, depending upon your organizational and uh, SDLC model. Um, you know, doing manual code checks is, is a very laborious time versus an automated code check is, is one example. So maybe you want to do that to be able to move things along. And at the end, always to measure and improve performance. And just to, just to I'm going to walk through these very quickly, given our time. Uh, you know, by measuring all of these things in terms of like closing the control gaps, you can, as I mentioned, you can show the difference um, uh, and what tactics you want to be used to do this um, is to examine support issues. In this case, gain senior management support by demonstrating risks and poor performance in a situation like this, provide direct support from the organization, a formative improvement project in this case, and then focus on the most impactful controls. Your environment is not, you know, you don't have to worry so much about the changes but you got to do the blocking and tackling on something like this, uh, you know, based upon that. In terms of formalizing the roles and responsibilities, the second strategy, same sort of thing that you do. You look at the analysis you've done in answering the questions, um, why the, you know, understand why these are a roadblock. And in some cases, if this, in, where we are showing an environmental change rate, 
consider giving more security responsibilities to the development organization by pushing it left, provide more significant consultation and support to them as they're, as they're doing this. So again, have someone there on site, you know, as part of that organization that may be matrices to your organization and develop design security processes in uh, ways that support meeting development deadlines as soon as possible. Um, again, too, in terms of refreshing um, security requirements. Uh, again, what this means is uh, ensure that development organization is aware of all the security requirements associated with it. Uh, have a baseline application security policy and standards. All of us have, have done that and we're continuing to do that. Uh, ensure that current vulnerable information is communicated and incorporated within the development tools. Um, and then identify security requirements for major development technologies used to ensure that they are kept up to date. Um, fourthly, leveraging technology, again, in a changing environment, um, implement technologies uh, to address key controls like code checking, consider deployment development tools that automatically prevent detect vulnerable code. There are tools that can actually do that and stop you from even writing that code. Uh, train the developers on the use of these tools to support an agile environment and move to DevSecOps. So, um, tools aren't everything, but if you're going to have the developers do that, you want to make sure uh, that these decisions are made in the context of those. So you're going to have to help uh, pick them out and uh, possibly uh, maintain them as well. And the last is um, you, you've got to measure and improve uh, performance. Always, uh, again, uh, this is very important. Um, Set a goal for, re and again, if performance is not doing as well here, this is a good way to set a goal for reducing the number of defects per application. Get management to buy in this, set it up as a project, and then try to reduce that and have the developers, um, you know, reduce these vulnerabilities for prior they even get in production. And you can do this on a monthly basis and monitor the progress. And then consider monitoring or setting a goal for meeting production timeframes as well. So you might want to do this in the context of overcoming the issue of, well, it's just going to extend my time frames. So let's, let's, let's do this in the context of meeting our deadlines. How do we do that? How do we make it more efficient, not just effective? Um, I, I think if you approach the development organization with ways of doing this and making it more efficient, uh, using these tools and then integrating these processes, you have a better chance of uh, having them uh, reduce their defects. Um, so quick recap, um, applications are a key target for threat actors. We're in a very complex uh, environment. Uh, to fully assess applications, you've really got to uh, ask the six questions and answer them in the context of the degree uh, of, of various attributes within those questions. Um, and then uh, the analysis of those questions will actually lead uh, to uh, developing a prioritized list of strategies and tactics, uh, five key areas we've kind of mentioned at this point. Um, I'm just gonna ask if any of my colleagues here have any parting uh, thoughts and guidance from members on this, maybe wanna share their key insights or challenges that they've had and, and uh, any other words of wisdom before we conclude with um, the task force that we're working on and uh, the Q and A, and there, by the way, members uh, will please uh, there uh, answer the poll questions as we're going through this. Tom, I, I'd like to touch on two points. Sure, Andres. So, from the software engineering perspective, and I spent half my career writing code, so trust me when I say this, mm -hmm. you're better off convincing folks of the value of implementing programs like these than shoving them down their throats, Good right? Point. All you're gonna run into is resistance and all you're gonna run into is, you know, states of contention and that never ends well. So translating, this is wonderful material, translating some of it into something tactful that is convincing is gonna be important. The second point also is around translation. Now we're translating up not down to software engineers, but translating all of this up such that you get 
business buy-in because in some cases the culture of the company itself just by its own nature works against some of these principles mm. right they don't intend to work against it but it's just the culture of the business especially in in agile environments where you're writing code and testing quick and deploying quick a lot of these you know steps these methodologies these techniques they add so much overhead that they'll be seen as negatively impacting deadlines and and such. And so I think one of the key areas for people to focus on is taking all this amazing material and, and, and kind of translating it in your own head such that, like I said, you can be tactful both downstream to an engineer and upstream to the business because that's going to be critical. I think, I think uh, you, you're right. Uh, convincing and working with people is always better than, you know, hammering someone overhead. That never works, right, at like the time. Um, I, uh, a good point. You can use this information to help make your case and convince them rather than saying, well, you guys are just doing a terrible job at this, right? Um, someone comes up and says, you're doing a terrible job. Well, you might agree with them and say, okay, but you know, isn't it better to say, how, how can I do a better job? Or, or, or why is this a terrible, they might say, why is this a terrible job? I'm getting stuff out and users love my, my code, but you know, again, you know, why security is important in the, in the risks that occur. Um, and that's hard to do, unless you've had a breach, that changes everything, right? Um, but we don't, we don't want anyone to have that happen. So thank you, Andres. Anything else from Chris or John? To add on to that, you know, it is a lot about attitude because I, I haven't met a developer that really doesn't want to write secure code. Um, no. They're just already 120% allocated. So to try to work the way development teams in your organization are used to working, you know, work with them the year before to make sure that they can budget for the security requirements you're going to you're going to impose on them. Uh, so that if they are budgeting and allocating for it, the developers are going to have no problem instituting it. And then also taking the the attitude of any any security requirement that you have on them is just another requirement. They have ways of managing requirements, managing their backlog. And if we can get those security requirements in their backlog, just like their functionality requirements, you'll see a lot more cooperation. And then security vulnerabilities are just another defect. So how can we manage those security vulnerabilities into the way that they, you know, they manage their software defects so that they're prioritized appropriately and, and such, uh, you'll see a lot bigger wins. That's a very, very good point. Um... Well, if we're producing commercial software, it, it's quite clear in the contracts that we have with our customers that they're expecting us not to have defects, security defects in the code. So that sometimes loops back in, and, and I'm not saying it makes it easy, easy at all, but it might be more obvious, yeah, we really need to do that. If you're doing it just internally, it may be a harder challenge, but the point is, yes, it's just another, you've treated as another requirement. And I think also, um, as you say, put it in the budget, make it a part of something that we're going to do, you know, plan it out. Don't just kind of say, okay, do it. Uh, I don't have the budget. Now you got, you, I think, I think it's the way you go. It's always the way you go do things. And you're right. No, they don't want to write insecure code. Right. I mean, but I mean, nobody, nobody wants an unfunded mandate either, you know? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So um, thank you for those perspectives. There, there are, a couple, uh, there's a couple of questions maybe. Wondering how different members have helped to scale this from less than 10 development teams to greater, to greater than 30 development teams. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, it, you know, it is, is kind of, all right, you know, how do you take this and move it? You got different development teams all over. I don't know if any of you guys have that issue or. Uh, so. So my, my organization has, we have 1800 applications. Um, the biggest part is to start small uh, and scale from there. Prioritize your application portfolio. Where are your crown jewels? Where are, not only where are your crown jewels, but where are the application teams that support you and that are willing to experiment and try new things? Combine those together, your most critical applications, as well as your, your most engaged development teams that are 
looking to uh, looking to adopt new new techniques and that can be your pilot group start small right. and then once you get a few wins you can start expanding to there maybe expand to all of your critical applications you'll have some resistant teams leave them behind let them resist um, but then at some point you're going to hit a critical mass where then you can force those teams that are resistant to then adopt your your methodologies yeah good good advice thank you again for that the uh i don't know if there are any other questions here or, or i'm just going to move on the, the other one is could you enable closed captions and or live transcript i uh i'll have to talk to uh the uh our support team uh, on the availability of that i I, I believe these are available to members, but I don't know how we're handling it with non-members. I will say this, I mean, uh, you know, unfortunately the presentation uh, doesn't provide the great promise that, uh, that, that Chris, uh, John and Andres provide. Uh, and I'm sorry for that, but you will get a copy of this anyway that I think will maybe help shape some of your perspectives if, if we can't provide a live transcript. Um, last, lastly, uh, this is one of many task forces and, and many content editions that we're working on. Again, I have a, a couple of weeks to kind of uh, write some of this up and, and uh, take the, the, the concepts and put them in a, a questionnaire format, which we're working on. So uh, that's, that's still a work in progress, but we're looking to finish that up this month. Um, we are um, going to have a security monitoring SOC SIM uh, questionnaire uh, that's going out to the collaborative members, uh, and then we're going to have a, um, a virtual briefing on that and opening up to other people on that. It talks all about, you know, the use of third parties and MSSPs and the value and documentation. Uh, so, so we're looking forward to that. We just started our operational technology security team um, and the issues around uh, reigning in OT. Security metrics team is active. We're building a, a workbook and we're continuing to put that out to members. And we're going to have a big uh, virtual briefing on that at the end of the year. And we're going to start our privacy and data regionalization um, uh, session uh, soon. So uh, to conclude, with great thanks to uh, my our, our executive sponsor here and our panelists for their time and input to this. It makes all the difference. The presentation is great. I know it's a lot to go through, but hearing the experience of, of our panelists makes makes all the difference. And I, I we are greatly uh, uh, appreciative of that. Um, take a CPE credit. We'll we'll vouch for that. Members will get the guidance document uh, and the workbook over the next few weeks. Guests, you can request this uh, just by you can see the uh, uh, the email address uh, to. Uh, make that request. Uh, we've answered, I think, the questions and you've taken the poll questions. Uh, and again, uh, just take a moment here uh, when you get the presentation uh, to go to uh, Andre's uh, blog here, which is interesting, Humble Application Security Advice from an Old School Practitioner. Um, it's a very, very valuable read. Uh, and based on practical experience. And, uh, and that's what we get out of the collaborative. You're hearing from members who have practical experience, um, not, not theoretical experience or not uh, experience based upon what you hear from a specific tool. So um, with that, uh, I will conclude. I'd like to thank all members and guests who spent their time with us today. And again, my panelists, wishing you all a great rest of the Thursday, Friday weekend. And uh, we, we hope to see you again soon in our next virtual briefing. Take care. Take care, everyone.